And um, also, if you have questions, you can type them into the chat and we will uh, deal with them afterwards. And with that, I want to give the floor to Mr. Hladky. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Astrid. Thank you for the kind invitation. I'm going to show you a quite risky uh, presentation today. Risky due to the fact that it's still um, an online presentation and it's still a, a Timo version, but it's online. Uh, but nevertheless, we've checked it out before. It should work. Otherwise, we have some backup system available and we're going to manage it. Uh, if you agree, I will uh, sh share the screen. And please give me a sign if you can already see it. Not yet. Oh, oh. now it's starting. Just one more moment. At least from my perspective, it looks good. Yeah, we can see so, Austria now. You can, you can see Austria. This is the starting um, picture. If you go to the so-called horror natural hazard overview of risk assessment in Austria, an application that is online, freely available without uh, restrictions uh, since 2007. Uh, you have to go back in history, 2007 at the time, um, it was the early days of Google and Google Maps. Uh, it's hard to believe uh, as of today that at that time, uh, a visual risk zoning and mapping system was quite extraordinary. So we, get, we were highly rewarded by the European Commission with one and an Austrian price uh, for this application. And we felt quite comfortable with this situation. Just to show you some details, you can see here on the left side, now we are on this on this flood uh, risk system. If you see here, some of you are familiar with the city of Vienna. You, you see it here. We have these classical zoning systems with the color codes, uh, light blue, dark blue, and the yellow shade um, expressing the different uh, levels of water following a flooding. Um, and what we, uh, as, as feeling quite comfortable with the system, this is widespread and widely used in Austria for risk zoning and risk assessment um, issues. What we were not aware was the fact that at least water is a piece of a living that has never had a map, um, a real map in his hand. And people, more than 50%, uh, have no idea what is north and south when they, they have a paper in, in your hand, a map. Due to, simply due to the fact that they're all only using their, their, their mobile phones. And Google Maps is showing the directions. And they have no uh, education and no training at all uh, with uh, maps and zoning systems. So for us, as being technicians and being familiar with the genesis of, of risk zoning and mapping, this was unbelievable when we figured this out. And due to the simple fact, we decided to, to use this uh, publicly available technology and combine it with our approach to risk zoning and mapping to our traditional risk communication. And what I'm um, happy to, uh, to present you today is uh, a 3D, you see it here left up, a 3D risk visualization, a three-dimensional risk visualization that is going to be loaded now. It will take some, some seconds. And uh, we are already uh, testing this for more than six months. We have extremely good feedback from, from our clients, not only from, from the professional uh, community of our business, but especially from clients, and the younger they are, the more enthusiastic they are about the results. And uh, what we learn as of today is that 
it's going to change the, our way of communicating risks inside the insurance community, but inside the whole risk management, management cycle. And hopefully you get the same impression when I will show you um, at least some details of this three-dimensional uh, version. It has nothing to do anymore with the risk zoning and mapping with a map, with a two-dimensional, uh, let's say, um, non-speaking paper. Uh, maybe you can see already the, the, the water moving on the map, on the, yeah. on the picture. You can see a house here. And the only thing you need now is the mouse. You, you don't need any explanation. And you can help yourself with your mouse into scenarios. You can turn the map. You can move in and move out. And you get a lot of information here on the left side, which is explained. For example, here, where it means in meters, half meter, one meter, the depth of water according to the risk scenarios you can uh, choose on the bottom side here down left on the bottom for example you can see here the one in 300 years flooding scenario attacking this house and you can shift it easily to a once in 30 years scenario you can see it's a completely different picture and if you want to have more details you can rotate you can watch the house from different angles and you already see some risk information attached here on the cornerstones of the house. And when I go back to the one in 300 years, it's quite easy to imagine what happens to your house if you're living on the ground floor. You will have up to two meters water, unfortunately, in your house. And if you have, as it is here, if you have an access to an, an underground garage, you can imagine what will happen to your car if it's unfortunately parked inside the, the building. If you go back to the once in 30 years, nothing will happen. But it's not our purpose, our goal to, uh, to show uh, what, what's going on when the water is coming, but most of all, it's about uh, prevention and, and about uh, avoiding risk. What can you do on an individual level? And I will show you some features that are, that are going far beyond any risk assessment as we know it already. Here on the left side, once again, you have a way to erect, for example, a protection wall. This is doing some. It isn't doing anything. Sorry for that. It's it's still loading here. Can you see it already, Astrid? No. But it will take some seconds. Now it's here. As you you can see here that there was a protection wall erected by the system. It's up to 1.12 meters high. You get, let's say, a plan how to construct your wall to protect your building here on this side. And this comes for the one in 300 years scenario. You can see it. And if people are arguing or complaining, I don't want to build the wall. Uh, being some 90 centimeters or one meters high, this is not good at all. It will be sufficient to have sandbags just in case of emergency, then choose sandbags here. You can choose sandbags. And let's look what will happen. It's loading this picture. I already see it, Astrid. Yes, it's there. Yeah. And you, you get a red sign here. Barrier cannot be erected simply due to the fact that the water is too deep. If we change the scenario to once in 30 years, you can see it should be sufficient to erect the sandbag wall, but don't be too happy. You see, you get some sort of construction plan even how to uh, erect your sandbags, but you see a figure here. 
you would, to protect your building here, you would need up to 15,300 sandbags to protect your building. It's really nice having these features uh, because people are always arguing, I don't want to have any fixed uh, protections. I don't uh, want to build this because I want to, to see the water. It's very nice to live at the seashore. And just in case of the water, I will put up some sandbag barriers. It's from our technical experience, usually sandbags are most, in most of the cases are completely useless. And we can show it now for every building here uh, in Austria. Uh, this system works for every building, no matter where it is. It's touching the whole uh, country. Every uh, house that is uh, erected officially is uh, can be uh, risk assessed when it comes to flood. Uh, still imagine or try to compare what we have seen uh, up to now, uh, before this three-dimensional version we are going to implement. We had a two-dimensional one. It was just a map. There was not even, uh, for a lot of people, it was not even possible to distinguish the direction of the water where it's coming up or down. Uh, flowing north or south. So you see the water uh, flowing in the right direction. And regarding these uh, movements, I can show you another feature going back to the ones in 300 years. And the feature is here on the bottom line. It's a video scenario. It's loading now. You see it on the left side here. And it, it's already running quite quick, but I will stop it around here and move in lower, uh, slower steps. So you can see it here. Uh, approximately two hours after the, uh, the rainfall, the water is coming. And some minutes later, the whole region here will be flooded, as you can see. And some minutes later, it's only a few minutes later, the water is gone. This is quite typical for Austria, as most of the rivers are quite uh, have uh, a quite uh, um, high um, uh, water speed. So the water comes quickly, but it goes away quite quickly. What, what you can see now is that the water remains here. If I go to, for example, to three hours, you, you can see it now. A part of the water is still on the surface close to the, the building. And this causes completely different damages to the structure of buildings. The water that is coming quickly and leaving the building after one or two minutes, it only leaves a, a lot of troubles for sure and a lot of dirt. But water standing here for hours or sometimes even for days causes completely different damages and losses to the building structure. The, the walls are getting wet, are soaking wet. The surface is uh, not only dirty, but most of, in most of the cases are gone and have to be replaced. Another feature that we have implemented in this map is regarding the firefighters or civil uh, protections. Uh, in just in case of a major flooding, when it comes to this one in 300 scenario, you can, uh, it's already loading again. We'll see it soon, hopefully. Just a second. We have changed already the scenario and now you see red lines uh, implemented in this, in this map. Doesn't work now. Yeah, we can see some yellow lines and some red lines. And, and some, some red lines, okay. Yeah. But this is for the scenario. But I would try to explain it. Uh, the red lines are showing these roads 
that are not accessible anymore for the uh, for civil uh, protections uh, or for firefighters as they do the most of the protection work in Austria. So we have implemented um, scenarios. Uh, is it possible to, uh, to have uh, free access to, uh, to the, uh, the spots where the, the, the water is already uh, quite high? Um, why is this so important? We have talked to the firefighters and as of now, the situation is, is completely different. Uh, it goes like this, that there was an alarm and they are moving out with their, with their cars, with the blue lights flashing on. And the first car that is coming to, as it is, to this address, they are just um, like some, some scouts are scouting. What is the scenario? Is it accessible? Is it accessible or not? What we are offering with this um, accessible feature is uh, the a possibility to, to optimize the structure of the intervention for the, the, the helping hands that are going on. It's a completely new way of, of uh, alarming and uh, shortening the, 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 uh, the time of action for the, the, the people um, helping uh, just in case of losses. Um, what we will uh, expect uh, as this will be implemented in the next weeks, it will be it will uh, be implemented. I guess we will open it on the, on the very first days of June. Just to remember, it will be publicly available. It is available for all uh, for free for each and every one in Austria. And uh, this will cause uh, definitely for sure a lot of. Uh, requests um, simply due to the fact that it's limited up to approximately 100 uh, people uh, using this system at the same time. And we will, uh, we will see a lot of complaints. We are already aware of this fact, but otherwise the system is too complex. It's such a, uh, such a huge amount of data to live. Uh, that we cannot offer uh, a permanent access for 500 or, or 1,000 people. We have tested it with approximately 100 people at the same time. It works. It works properly, but it it could be then we then when you will try to use it afterwards uh, at the beginning of June that we, you will have to wait maybe several minutes to get access to the system. Later in the year we will try to improve the accessibility to the system, but it's simply. Um, a matter of costs. It's we are not Google, we are not Amazon. Uh, even if if uh, the the server is run by the Austrian government, it's way too expensive to have uh, such applications available for for thousands of people at the same time. It, we simply cannot afford it. Nevertheless, for us, we have some some priority for our internal internal risk assessors. They have permanent access, but for the public, there will be approximately 50 to 100 um, places or, or access points available at the same time. So this should be sufficient for, for standard use. Um, I will be more than happy, it's approximately 20 hours um, to answer your questions. Uh, hopefully, uh, if there were any, Otherwise, I could show you a lot of different aspects of the system here on the left side. I've only shown you the first part here. It's the whole 3D, the risk visualization. There were a lot of different approaches, but none of them are already three-dimensional. But we are already working on the three-dimensional workload uh, for, for snow, for example. Um, I have to explain it quite uh, easily. You can simply put snow load on your roof. And when the snow load gets too high, you can see your own house uh, and the, the roof crumbling down under the pressure of snow. The same comes for hail with the, uh, the, the, the stone, uh, the, the, the size of this hailstone. Uh, what damages are different sizes of hailstones 
doing to your facade or the facade of your, of your house. So there was a lot of work to do with this three-dimensional um, software available, but it's, it has only to be done. There's nothing intellectual to do anymore. The major workload is already finished. And the most complex one was the water one. And we started with this one with the flooding. And the rest will be just a matter of time and, 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 and workload. And we will do it. A final position from our perspective, we are fully aware of the fact that this will be the end of, a, of the classical uh, mapping systems that we all are, have been using for 15 years. Because the minute people see these three-dimensional maps, the minute they don't want to work with the two-dimensional maps anymore. That's what we what was, was our experience or lesson learned after these maps went viral inside our community. Simply due to the fact, just to repeat it once more, that 50% or approximately 50% are not able to use a map anymore, to handle a map properly, simply due to Google Maps. It's a, a pity how, how technology has a lot of advantages, but at the same time creates new disadvantages. And this is uh, a completely different way, as we called it, to address our client, to communicate the risk. And this is not TikTok. This is not some demo version. This is already running. This is real life. And we are very happy that we are into this process. Thank you for the time being now. More than happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Thomas, for this uh, very nice presentation. And um, the amount of data that is processed here was clearly seen in the delay that we uh, saw and also in yeah your voice fading away at some stage. But I think it was pretty uh, understandable. And we have already a few questions. Uh, did you monitor the chat or shall I read them to you? No, please read it, Astrid, yeah. Uh, first one is from Alejandro, who was uh, asking uh, if you put a barrier to reduce the risk to a building, does the system then correct for the risk of downstream properties? So does the system tell you anything what is happening downstream then? Um, good question and answers simply no. Um, the system is uh, not that interactive because if you implement a risk barrier or a protection wall, you would have to do a completely new calculation for the, the, the downside uh, of the river. And this is way too complex and way too expensive. Just to explain the technical background, every 100 meter, there's a so-called uh, theoretical knot. And this knot would have to be calculated with millions of calculations for every 100 meter of, an, of a river. And this is simply impossible. Uh, there's another uh, answer to your question from a, a legal perspective. In Austria, you are not allowed to uh, implement fixed barriers without public uh, permission. So uh, water protection is a public good and is a public purpose. This is no individual purpose. You can protect your house, but not your, uh, your uh, territory. If it's uh, neighboring a, a flood or, or uh, neighboring a, a river or neighboring a, a, a river system, this is public work. Okay, so Alejandro seems to be satisfied. Uh, next question is from Daniel, who is asking whether uh, how the system is dealing with uncertainties. Is it just yes, no, areas flooded or not, or does the system give probabilities? The system gives uh, completely details. Uh, if you, I have already stopped the, the, the presentation, but if you, you use the presentation, this www.hora.gv.at, you get all the technical informations, how the calculation is done. Uh, just to give you an, uh, an impression of this uh, transparency, we have already uh, supported approximately 200 um, works uh, um, works on, on academic level on this horror topic. So you get all the technical information 
uh, on on flooding. For example, I will try to open it here uh, in. Um, you get to tutorials. You get a hydrological. You get a hydraulical report. All the the, the technical basic information is offered for the academic uh, community and is widely used for academic workload. Hope this answers to your question, Daniel. Uh, next one is from uh, Mia. She is asking in what way is this data used in underwriting of the insurance companies mm -hmm. and how can you help the munis municipalities? Yeah. Um, it, it depends on the company. I, I will try to answer it from my perspective and uh, give you some uh, examples how um, other colleagues are using this. We, for example, in Grave, that's a wechselseitig insurance company, we are applying uh, our NETCAT, uh, natural catastrophe or storm insurance tariffs, and combining the existing hail zones. Uh, there is, if you go on the, on, in the hail, on the hail button, you see uh, three or up to four different hail zones. And when your house is situated in a, a risk prone hail zone that is significantly higher than the next one, you get an additional premium load. So this is risk based pricing, as we call it risk based pricing. Um, some other colleagues of international or global insurance players, they have uh, the, the water zoning that I have shown you. Uh, the blue and the dark blue and the yellow zoning, they use this as a, as a differential uh, pricing uh, feature. We use the hail zone in, in Austria. It's hail Austria. But other colleagues use the water zoning for, for the tariff system. So to answer the question, it is used, it's quite widely used in the calculation on an individual level when it comes, for example, to big commercial clients, to industrial clients, um, we make individual risk assessments out of this horror as it is uh, has a high resolution in altitude. The resolution is approximately 10 centimeters and in, in length, it's less than one meter. So it's really high resolution if you have an industrial plant you can uh, uh, risk assess every single building with this uh, with this uh, horror system since approximately 15 years so it's the standard for risk uh, assessment uh, even in fire risk for example due to the fact that it's so uh, that the resolution is so good Okay, the next one is also very interesting coming from Ian. Uh, can the system model the impacts of upstream flood reduction methods, e.g. planting or uh, tree planting or water retention ponds upstream on the impact uh, of the flood episode? Um, So-called technical measures or man-made measures that are fixed, uh, uh, they are, we, we have ways to question the the man uh, but we have um, a way to um, to show the risk without the uh, without the, the the application of these man-made protections so we can uh, create the illusion that these um, technical barriers or protection measures are not working or that they are broken, for example. And uh, that's the reason for why we call it the so-called Restrisikozone in German, a zone of the remaining risk. And this, this zone implements the complete loss or the complete failure of man-made protection measures. So to answer your question more shortly, we can look at both ways. We see it with a protection barrier and without a protection barrier. And we can choose that does it work, is it good, and what will be if it doesn't work. And we do this work with our clients on an on, on individual level on a daily basis. 
but it's mainly related to barriers rather than to um, ecology, ecological measures like trees or exactly. having ponds. Exactly. Yeah, ecological measures are, are not implemented yet. We, we are aware of the positive effects. We are aware since more than 10 years of the sometimes even striking positive effects of retention, for example, the widening of retention uh, possibilities or the the planting of, of trees in uh, close to the to, to river systems, which has dramatic positive effects on, on the flooding uh, scenarios, but it's not implemented in our scenario. It's way too complex, honestly. Yeah. Okay, then Elena, thanks for the nice presentation. And she has three questions. First is, uh, in the system, have you integrated the risk assessment maps from the floods directives? Are the scales similar or quite different? No, they're fully implemented. Uh, we have been uh, already online before the flood directive. And we, we made some changes with the 200 and 300 years return period. But the changes were not, um, not dramatically. They were just slight changes. Uh, after the flood directive uh, uh, came out, but it's it's fully integrated in the flood directive. Okay. Second question: Have you or can you integrate different climate change scenarios? Uh, yes, we can. This already we can uh, integrate this. This is mostly for for flood. We can do this um, for other netcat um, uh, perils. It's, it's way too complex. For example, for, for storm, you can see here uh, the, in horror, you have a quite different ways to, uh, in, in risk assessment when it comes to windstorm. We have winter scenarios, we have summer scenarios. You get, uh, the, uh, when you come in the office in the morning, you get the yesterday's wind gust model. You get in the horror system, free, uh, accessible, but uh, this does not integrate any uh, climate change or wind-related uh, results. Uh, the answer is, is quite easy. It, it comes together with the Austrian topography. The Austrian topography is so different that when it comes to wind, for example, you have no clear picture of uh, wind on the ground. And that's the only wind speed on the ground that is interesting us. Uh, how this will really affect it by climate models. And the same comes for, uh, for um, lightning. The same comes for, for fluvial flood. It's, it could be different. Uh, in one valley, uh, the, it, it goes up, and the next valley, it's, it is going down. So it's, we, we are working a lot, especially in Graz, on the university, there's a special institute. Some of you are quite familiar with this. So the Wegener Center for Climate Change, which is uh, running here in Austria, um, and uh, a weather monitoring grid with some 800 weather positions in a very small territory to get high resolution data. And uh, the results are really striking simply to the fact that striking is how different the results are. Even some kilometers away, the, the, the technical results of this uh, high resolution grid could be completely different, whatever parameter you, you are watching it. It's, there's still a lot of work to do. Okay, third question from Elena. Does the model also incorporate hydrogeomorphological elements? It does, yeah, yeah. Completely, yeah. Okay, and then we have another one from Mia, and I guess it's a yes. Are the data used or usable for by municipalities land use planning, either to implement climate adaptation measures yeah. or do not build at the area or remove buildings? Uh, they are fully used and accessible by public authorities, especially by municipalities, simply due to the fact that it's uh, for free and easy accessible for, for smaller municipalities. And we have a lot of them in Austria. It's even more complex to get data. They face the same situation than a private or individual one. So they're using this. And we know this from, from the public side of our PPP uh, that. Uh, 
especially smaller municipalities, to rely heavily on these informations as they're so easily accessible. Uh, you get on, on regional level, you get a lot of geographical information systems, but you don't get um, outside this horror platform, as we call it, you don't get harmonized information for the whole for a whole region or the whole country. So just to make it more clear, uh, easier, uh, you, a geographical information system could show different uh, uh, calculator ways of calculations referring on the uh, depending on the region where it's, where it's applied. This doesn't come for all. We use the same uh, level of calculation for the whole territory, which makes it uh, easier to access for for them and easier to compare. Even yeah, it it creates some difficulties. If there are differences in the way how you calculate or did your, your mathematics or your statistics, but since approximately 15 years, we were quite easily uh, able to, to handle these differences. Um, simply due to the fact that when you are already on this level uh, in an exchange of view with the client, for example, you have already won the war because the client is already into this risk management process. And it's not the question of being right or wrong. If this calculation was, if this modeling was right or the other uh, calculation or modeling was right. It's both the modeling and nature shows us afterwards, maybe 100 years afterwards, who, who was right. But it's, it's a question of, of, of your approach to risk management, if you use these tools or not. And it's not a question of, of how precise and how good and bad one tool is, or if is it better than the other one. That's not the question technically. Mia has a follow-up question. Could uh, the system be used to not offer insurance where, ins insurance where you have repeated floodings? Um, I know Mia quite well. Uh, Mia, would you be so kind and repeat the question? <laughs> Mia, you can also uh, unmute yourself and yeah. Um... yeah, 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 yeah. I can, I can. Hi, hi, Thomas. Hi, Mia. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, the the thing is, as you know, uh, in Norway, I, I work with the insurance sector for many years. So we, what we did with this, Thomas know very well, is to uh, help the municipalities by having this type of system. And then we add on uh, the um, all the insurance loss data, yeah, I know. so that yeah. the insurance have the possibility to understand is it really the where are really the real impact, uh, and we managed to do that by uh, because GDPR is a big thing, you know, you have personal data, but what we saw was that that is very efficient for for both the. The national flooding agency and the municipalities that they get access uh, only access not on no, it's not open it's it's an access only for the flooding uh, agency and the and the municipalities to see where what did actually happen after the flood where did it the impact which houses were uh, impacted and where which areas are vulnerable and that makes the municipalities being able to plan and, yeah. and change the pipes, all of this, you know, Thomas. So the other one is actually the question I did put up and it's like, would that lead to, with this, which you use showing, could it lead to people not getting insurance because they see this is a repeated yeah. area for and vulnerable for new, uh, new yeah, uh, okay. no. yeah. Th Thank you, Mia. Um, honestly, the answer is quite easy, it's no, uh, because, uh, uh, in Austria, these uh, the, the insurance coverage that we are, um, as of today, offering is very, very limited. And so you get it repeatedly. If you have even three times in 10 years, uh, if you're facing losses due to a flooding, um, you, you get this uh, a full recovery and you get insurance cover. Um, this will be different should there be... Uh, a completely new um, system of compensation could be implemented in Austria. Because if you have a, a, a total sum insurance, for example, and you face losses, and you lose your whole house, for example, for sure there would be um, a restriction 
to rebuild a house in a flood prone area near. Definitely. Otherwise, such systems wouldn't work. For the existing systems with this very low compensations, sometimes it's only a few thousand euro, you get full recovery several times without limit near. You're welcome. Okay. Thanks. There's another one from Daniel. Uh, would insurance companies be willing to invest uh, into river restoration, e.g. retention, in certain areas to reduce the flood risks? Excellent question. Um, in in Swiss, this, Switzerland, this is already happening. It's already taking place and they are quite successful with this. They are doing this approximately more than 10 years and we are looking very, we are monitoring this very, very closely. One of our proportions as the uh, Austrian insurance industry is, then whenever we get a system uh, running with the full coverage of flood, we, we would need some legal constructions behind. Maybe we get them somehow, um, maybe with the next government, I have no idea. Uh, then it could be that the money that we earn beforehand, the premium income, that we invest this money, not in our banking system, but in flood protection, in retention uh, measurements, whatever, because this is much more effective to, to invest one euro in protection uh, than to give it uh, on, on a bank account. Yeah? We are fully aware of this fact. And the um, um, mandatory risk insurance system could come together with the obligation for the insurance industry to invest at least part of the money in protection measures. This is a, a very good, uh, good idea and it's fully supported by our industry. But it's only implemented in Switzerland yet? Uh, they are, it's not implemented, but they are doing it already, simply due to the fact that they have a mandatory system. If you have a fire uh, insurance in, uh, in most of the cantons, in uh, most of the, the, the local uh, uh, authorities, uh, the, the fire system is run by the, the local canton and they are offering, um, it's not offering, there is a mandatory fire insurance together with a mandatory net cap insurance by combining eight natural barrels. And for them, it's very easy to, to put the money that they get in from the insurance industry, from the insurance side and invest it in, in for example, flood or avalanche protection. And they do it quite successfully. I suppose, Elena, your question is also uh, answered with this. If not, you can just unmute yourself and ask it again. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, I wanted to know a bit more, uh, but who is investing? The cantons, the insurance companies, is it a reinsurance company and therefore a public reinsurance system? In a bit, a bit clearer about who, and also, uh, so one is who is investing, is the question. Uh, for Switzerland, there were, there were two ways. Uh, most of the time it's the canton, it's the, the regional authority that is sometimes is also running the insurance uh, co company. It's a different system. You don't have this in Spain or other ways that the local authority is running the local insurance company. And then they're investing the money and they are running the firefighters and they are running the whole civil protection system. That's, that's only Switzerland uh, typical. You, you can't copy and paste it anywhere else. But um, there are already some uh, striking positive examples that private Swiss uh, insurance companies are investing in protection measures. For example, Schweizer Mobiliar, it's the biggest Swiss uh, insurance company. They are, they are already running successfully several of these individually financed projects, river dams uh, for flood protections. It's a good investment for them. They're simply and financing it. Yeah? And the scale? The sc I mean, are we talking about... So no, it's only that, on a regional level. It's some, maybe some two or three million Swiss francs, maybe a little bit more, but quite and effectively. And, yeah. and in terms of scale in the river, like, you know, you're talking about the investing in, because I think the question is investing in river restoration. 
for flood protection. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the scale here, honestly. Yeah, I can say I know I have I have access to some some individual measures they have implemented successfully. There were presentations available, but about about the scale of, of the whole story of no idea, I don't know, honestly. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, are there any more questions? Uh, Mia again, are the Austrian insurance companies discussing the use of nature-based solutions under the building back better? Yes, we are discussing this, but it's um, it's a long way, honestly. Yeah, long way to discuss, but we're familiar with this issue, but it's a little bit too early to have a, a, the full picture and a clear view, honestly. Okay, if no one else has a question, I have two. <laughs> um, the one is, is the, the, the system somehow combined with the weather forecast system so that I know, okay, how much, uh, how high will the flood be that is now coming with the rain next week? So that I can start filling my sandbags? Uh, it's not directly combined, but there is a link to um, the, the big event um, uh, pre-announce or alarming system. It's implemented in the horror. It's the latest icon on the left side of the horror. Oh, okay. And if you have a one or two days uh, warning ahead for big uh, storm zones, for example, it's color coded. Uh, and, and, and especially in flood, there's an online, uh, there were online um, alarm systems implemented in the horror. If, I, if we have another minute, I could show it to you. I will uh, once again uh, show up the presentation because it's really striking how easy it works. We have another seven minutes, so... Um... Yeah, no, it, it will just take one or two minutes. It's, it's quite easy. It's already sharing from my screen. You know, we cannot see it yet. Just wait a minute. Maybe I can ask the other question meanwhile, because I think it's a really uh, useful tool and catchments do not end at a country borders. So my question would be, is there yeah. any intentions to expand it to the whole of Europe? Or in other words, what resources would be needed to expand it to Europe? Um, at least inside our community, this whole system is really famous and all the colleagues know it. And um, a lot of colleagues have similar systems, but there is no technical um, copy and paste uh, possible simply due to the fact that the, the basis data in most of the cases is completely different. Mm. And to implement, let's say, the whole uh, a common surface, a common uh, cover, uh, on, on different levels or, or different basements, it's simply technically not correct. But what we have, what we are um, willingly offer, offering, and we always do, is our systems, our software. If someone wants to make use of our software, he can, we can give it uh, away for free. It's our, our own uh, our property. It's our own intellectual property as insurance industry. And we offer this for free. We don't want to make money out of this so i it should already work yeah and i will go back there was a you can see it here it's called on the left side on this uh button can you see it already astrid yes left above it's called Begel aktuell if you click this you get a picture of austria with uh triangles not not yet you will see it It's still glad. I'll just wait a minute. And you get uh, a picture of Austria with dark blue or light blue or white triangles. Not yet. Not yet, no. Now, now, now we have it, yeah. Okay. And if you click inside one triangle, for example, I, I do it here now, you get an Online, it's online, it's, it's really life. The amount of water running through the river here is the river Danube. 
close to or, or near Vienna, north of Vienna. And now you get direct access to this uh, system. Can you see it already? Yeah. And you see here on the right side down the, the, the return period. If it's green, uh, the, you see this would be a one in a year flood here. So we have very little water now in the Danube as of today. And if there would be a, a threat or a threatening situation, the forecast you see here on the right side of the graph, the forecast would go up and it, it would be color coded red. So you have time enough. For example, you see here uh, on the bottom line, the 2nd of May, it's one day, it's two days ahead. So you have up to two days uh, time to implement protection measures. Mm -hmm. This is really fascinating. And this is available for all the, um, the, the measurement points in Austria that are online. It's fully available on the whole. Okay, very cool. Thank you, Thomas. Are there any more questions? Cannot see, no, no raised hands. With that, I would want to close this webinar with the announcement that the next Merlin webinar will be on June 5th, and it will be a presentation of Merlin Work Package for colleagues and their experiences in working with different e economic sectors. And uh, they will also tell uh, their experiences with transformation processes and so on. So, uh, Thomas, it was a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you once again for this excellent presentation. And um, yeah, bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.